Oh, David. We're innocent until they can prove you guilty. <laughs> that is right! That is right, my friend! <laughs> hey, David, are you prepared to go to jail? Good morning, everybody! Hi, David! Hi, David! Hero. Thank you, my friends. I've just got one thing to say this morning. I've never been so proud to be an Australian as today. I may have broken the law, but I did not break my oath to the people of Australia and the soldiers who keep us safe. David McBride, hero of Australia. You don't get a fair trial. You know, it, it's, it would be a mockery to call what David McBride has gone through in this courtroom a trial. He never had a chance. His lawyers had access to documents, they'd had access to them for years, spent hundreds of thousands of dollars building a defence. And then the Commonwealth, after the court case started, when the hearing started, they came in, flashed their national security badge and removed all the documents he needed to prove what he had been saying about the Defence Department. So he was literally left without a leg to stand on. I mean, I don't know about you, but I thought in this country you got a fair trial. So when it's national security, you're, you, they might as well charge you and convict you at the same time. It was an absolute fast. So today we're here because this man, this courageous man who stood up to the establishment is going to be sentenced. So this is the end of this chapter of this travesty that's unfolded. So we have some people here today who want to speak in support of David. And it's my pleasure to introduce them. And first, we have a lady here who's also suffered at the hands of defence. And my experience as a whistleblower on the banks taught me that when an institution is rotten, it manifests itself in several ways. And Julianne is here to speak about how the Defence Department treats veterans and the whole issue of veteran suicide with callous indifference. So Julianne lost her son David so she has first-hand experience of what, of how the Defence Department operates, what they do, and how 
they basically have no shame. So I'll hand over to Julianne. and that's going to take over a lot of the media and we're going to be talking about cost of living and what I want this government to know is we need people to be living to have a cost of living. My son... My son is dead. Um, there's no taking away from that. There's no bringing it back. He's dead. That's what these politicians want. They want our veterans either dead or incarcerated for life. They will not look after you once you have left defence. It is a good career and I thank everyone who serves and everyone who has served. And, and they like their career, most of them like their defence career. But they get out, they get abandoned, they get pushed to the back and they die or they go to jail. We've got to stop this. We've gone from, I was thinking about the movie A Few Good Men. Um, last night, and I, I came up with now in politics we've got a few pusillanimous men. We have Dreyfus, uh, Miles um, and Keogh who have no idea what they're doing. If they had to serve a day, uh, they would just die themselves. Probably not dead like David's dead, but they wouldn't cope, believe me. They are, we had Miles sitting in the Royal Commission um, for, and I, that's another thing, a lot of Australians don't know that at the moment there's a Royal Commission going on into defence and veteran suicide. It's a Royal Commission that's been running for three years and it's finding out a lot of things. Okay, I wanted um, David McBride to go and talk there. Um, it, it was just another thing that they're finding systemic issues of what they do to our kids. You have to understand these are our kids and they are dead. They're not coming back dead, dead, dead. And when David McBride said it one night when I went to one of his talks, he said, if you get stabbed in prison or murdered in prison or even suicides in prison, we'll all move on. Like you all moved on from David. You can't help it, that's life. But we could have saved him. We could save David McBride. We have it right now. I sat in Senate estimates and I listened to defence and the Attorney General's office admit that they could do nothing for David McBride, that it was all being held by the US. I'm sitting in there shocked, why did this make the news? Because the US has us under a barrel. I don't want to get involved in strategies like submarines and that sort of thing. I, I don't. But Miles, Dreyfus and Keogh grow up, get a spine and stand up to the US bring Julian home, drop the charges from McBride, and free Dan McDuggan. This is Australia! And if you don't do it, you're going to end up dead, and it will be blood on your hands, and all the news blood on your hands. I've been calling this out since my son died. Stop. Just stop. For anyone who has served, they deserve the best. Thank you, David, for so much, for so much, and for even allowing me to speak today. It matters because you matter. Next, next we'll hear from Senator David Shoebridge, a man who I've known for many years and I think his outstanding quality is he always seems to be on the right side of every issue. Microphone. So it's my great pleasure to introduce David. Do you guys prefer the microphone or not? I'm really asking the media here. Uh, uh, Wait, uh, the amplification would be good. The people can't hear you. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for coming out today. We're on Ngunnawal and Ngambri land, and let's pay our collective respects to First Nations peoples. And remember how many First Nations peoples are in jail. In jail for protecting their land and their water, and wanting the continuation of their culture. So let's commit, and we leave here today to spend the next years and months working alongside First Nations peoples as well, and their struggle for justice. We're also here on budget, on budget day, while the media's attention is in large part dragged away to our house at the top of the hill here. 
We're here to say David McBride matters. We're here to say telling the truth matters. We're here to acknowledge the courage and bravery of David McBride, who stood up against one of the biggest institutions in this country to tell the truth. And for that, his government is trying to put him in jail for two or more years. What a shame and indictment on the Albanese government to let these proceedings uh, continue. I remember talking to David when he was first charged. And he, uh, he's a lawyer, and he's kind of a lawyer to his bones in many ways. And, and he, he was of the view that the system wouldn't permit this. Surely the system, with all these laws and checks and balances, surely it wouldn't permit it to get to the point where he actually goes to jail. Because remember, all he did was tell the truth. And I uh, remember saying to David, I think these bastards want to put you in jail. I think they want to put you in jail because putting you in jail sends a, a shiver, a, a cold front across the public service and particularly across defence. And, and that's the real impact. And, and David McBride is just the way in which the Commonwealth is sending that cold shiver across this country to say to anybody, if you step up and spill our secrets and you embarrass us and you tell the truth about what we're doing, we're going to hunt you to the ends of the earth and we're going to put you in jail. That's what Mark Dreyfus is permitting happen here today. That's the intent behind the prosecution against David McBride. This isn't about some pure form of the law. This is about the brute exercise of political power to shut down dissidents, to shut down whistleblowers, put them in jail if necessary, so nobody else does what David did. So we are here together, politicians, activists, friends, father, family, to say we stand beside David McBride. And I think we should say very loud and clear to this government, if David McBride spends it one nanosecond in jail, we will do what we can to make this government fall. And we'll do what we can over the next years and months to fundamentally change our laws. So we have a whistleblower commission to stand beside the people like David McBride. So that we have proper laws to protect telling the truth. And so there never is a crime in this country to speak truth to power. Thank you, David, for your courage. Thank you, all of you, for standing beside David McBride. This is a long struggle. David, your was a long struggle. But I've got to tell you this, it will be an indelible stain on the Albanese government if David walks into that court and walks out the back into a prison van. We can't let that happen. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. Uh, David, unfortunately, has to, he had to get an exemption from the party, uh, from a party room meeting to come down here to be with us this morning. So thank you very much for that, David. And of course, what, what David just said is very true. And this is what I am finding in conversations with whistleblowers around the country because people often talk to us before they blow the whistle. And the message that we are giving to whistleblowers loud and clear is do not be a whistleblower under the Albanese government. The government is so corrupt and vindictive, you'll be. They don't want truth tellers in the government. And that's the message that we have got out of here, and we are telling prospective people, don't ruin your lives. If you're going to do something, you have to, whatever you do, don't go through Dreyfus's hit process. It's a farce. All it does is plant a target on your back. Put some documents in a, an envelope and send it to a journalist and walk away. That's all you can do. We don't have, and this is something a lot of people don't realise, we've never had whistleblower protections. Dreyfus passes the laws that are called whistleblower protections, but they don't work. They just don't work. Well, and we're seeing an extreme case of that today. So, it's now my great pleasure to introduce uh, our next speaker, Lola Power, who is a, a young woman who's a law student and a good friend of Georgie McBride, who wanted to come today and speak about the impact on David's family. Because it's often forgotten that whistleblowing is a family affair, and it certainly had an impact on my family, 
and I don't know any whistleblower that would say different. So it's important to get that perspective. Thank you very much, sir. Lola. Hi, everybody. My name is Lola, and I was invited to speak on, as a friend of David on behalf of the youth in this country who believe that David should not be incarcerated for his role in exposing Australian war crimes. I'm a family friend of David's. I went to primary school with his daughters, James and Georgie. For as long as I've known David, I've always admired him. In addition to being the most courageous and noble person I've ever met, he's incredibly kind. David has always been a friend to my family. He's incredibly supportive of anyone struggling around him, always offering kindness and always treating us as part of his own extended family. Despite his immense suffering and sacrifice, David has always prioritised his family. I'm sure everyone has heard the story of him returning to Australia and facing arrest, or to attend a father-daughter dance. David is one of the most virtuous people I know. His actions have always been a sacrifice for the greater good. David has given over a decade of his life to this cause at great personal risk to his and his family's security and mental health. He is now facing the loss of his freedom for his pursuit of truth, justice and transparency. David knew the risk he was taking, but he vowed, the value he placed on doing what is right is so strong he could not be complicit in the crimes he witnessed. What does it say about Australia if David receives a jail sentence for exposing illegal activities? This sentencing holds so much weight for the future of truth and justice in this country. I am scared for a future where whistleblowing is punished, where change doesn't occur, where people aren't held accountable for their actions, and where criminals are protected and crimes covered up. I am scared that whistleblowing will no longer happen, and that truth will be a myth of the past. Australians can no longer be ignorant of these issues. Truth and transparency impact all of us. I want to know what the government is doing. I don't want taxpayer money to be funding David's prosecution or paying for him to go to jail. And I don't want that money to be paying to cover up war crimes. I want to live in a country that values truth and justice over secrecy. I want to live in a country that protects, not punishes, whistleblowers. A foundational argument of David's case was his duty as a lawyer against his duty as a soldier. As a law student myself, I feel lucky to have grown up with a strong legal role model that David is. David has always prioritised his legal duty to act in the public interest. The army praises leading by example, and I believe this is what David has always done. He has demonstrated courage in all his actions. The Public Interest Disclosure Act is a piece of legislation aimed to protect Commonwealth whistleblowers. Unfortunately, the act is almost impossible to navigate and use, especially considering the biases and conflicting interests of the Commonwealth who wrote the legislation. Protecting whistleblowers is essential to the safety of society. Whistleblowers too often become the victims of their own actions, facing prosecution and great legal ex personal expense. David's case started 11 years ago and he still presents an unmatched willingness to keep fighting. I admire David so much and I am so grateful for his courage and commitment to an important cause that seeks to make Australia a better place for all of us. He is an amazing role model. No daughters should have to grow up without a dad, especially one like David. I truly hope that justice prevails today for David and his family, but no matter today's outcome, David is on the right side of history. Thank you very much, Lola. Maybe there is some hope. I hope for the future. Um, I, uh, I said a few moments ago that when an organisation is corrupt and has a rancid culture, it will manifest itself in various ways. The same is true of governments. And another way in which the organised government has failed 
is in shameless. Shameless people. Shamelessly bending the knee to our great, shamelessly bending the knee to our great and powerful friend, the United States, in relation to Julian Assange, and I'm sure most Australians who are who the government is somewhat out of touch with have watched in horror as they have allowed this to be done to an Australian citizen. I mean, if, if a government won't stand up for one of their own, it's, it's just not, not worth a crumpet. So today, we are very, very privileged to have with us somebody to speak about how this government has failed in relation to Julian Assange, uh, and who better than his father, John Shipman. What rough beast is our command at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Here in court, behind us, you will see the results. I can't hear you. Here in the court behind us, we will see the results of that rough beast put upon David McBride. Same with Julian Assange. The nomenclature, the name Whistleblower, in my view, is an inadequate description of those men and women who, like Atlas, take the world of truth upon their shoulders and raise it up for us to see and contemplate and take action upon. Hero! Chelsea Manning, seven years in jail, 35 years sentence. Julian Assange, 15 years now going into the 16th year in one form of incarceration or another. David McBride, three years fighting for his, oh, I'm not going to say justice, don't get that around here, fighting for, to illuminate for us the wretched decay of a police action in Afghanistan that had fallen into depravity. What had happened in Afghanistan, you can read in the Iraq war files up until 2010, leaked by Chelsea Manning and still up on the WikiLeaks site. Have a look. Or you can read it in the 250,000 cable set still up on the WikiLeaks site. You'll know the truth of what it was that was contemplated and acted upon in Afghanistan. You can say this, that the increase in the use of fentanyl as an opiate in the United States is a barometer for the decline of interest in Afghanistan as the poppies no longer were suitable no longer cheap enough and no longer worked as fentanyl causes now 100,000 deaths per annum in the United States overdoses. You can see that as the barometer of a collapse into a depraved police action where soldiers would take as tokens, the nose or the ears of somebody they shot. That was the truth there. Brought to us by David McBride. 
who are today be central for bringing us an insight into what had, what had happened before our eyes in Afghanistan. Bear witness, and we bear witness to the elevation of the whistleblower, a poor name for a champion of truth. We bear witness to the elevation of those men and women to the pantheon of champions. And we will hold them forever close to our hearts and do whatever we can in our small or great ways to bring a sense of achievement to their lives rather than a sense of persecution. Free assignment, free Thank you, John. Thank you very much, John. Of course, Julian Assange's and David McBride's cases are linked. They involve very similar issues. And they're a good highlight of the utter hypocrisy and inconsistency of the Albanese government. Julian Assange published supposed national security material and he's been punished for publishing it as a journalist. David McBride is being punished as the person who supplied the material to the journalist. And the Australian government chose not to go after that journalist. They made it. They, they made a decision, one would think, that they didn't want to go after journalists because they might write mean things about the government or true things about the government. So instead, the journalists who published the story based on these supposedly sensitive documents that David passed to him, they gave him a medal. They gave him a medal and they're prosecuting David McBride. Where is he today? And they're doing nothing to protect Julian Assange, who stands in the same position as the man they gave a medal to for publishing this story. So, if you can understand that, please explain it to me. We gave Ben Robert Smith a medal. We, we, know, we know that the whistleblower protections in this country are an absolute joke. And in fact, for this government to be talking about whistleblower reforms and a whistleblower protection, agency while they're actively trying to put a whistleblower in jail is another thing that I, I can't quite get my head around either. But there's someone here today who's actually trying to, I guess you could say, make a silk purse out of a sow's ear with these whistleblower protections. And that's Kieran Pender from the Human Rights Law Centre, uh, who does a lot of work in this space, one of the leading authorities on whistleblower law in this country. So. It's my great pleasure to introduce Kieran Penn. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Another cold time in the morning. It feels like we're back here every week, and no doubt we'll be back here again, and we'll be in Adelaide protesting the prosecution of Richard Boyle as well. But your solidarity and support means so much. We can by acknowledging that we're on the stolen land of the Ngunnawal and Nambri people, and that Australia's first people were also Australia's first whistleblowers here telling the truth about the conditions of their colonisation. I think of Jeff and his whistleblowing, and others like him, Dr Ben Coe and others, who sparked the Royal Commission into Financial Services. And I think about the millions of Australians who are in a better place because we had accountability and change in our financial sector, because brave people like Jeff and Ben and others spoke up to journalists like Adele Ferguson. And I think about if those whistleblowers were in the same position now, tomorrow a whistleblower wakes up, a prospective whistleblower wakes up and they read the newspaper and they see that David McBride has gone to jail or been given a suspended sentence because our laws have failed and our government has failed to act. And I think about whether they'll still blow the whistle. 
and they think about what scandals we'll miss out on because people will stay silent instead. What royal commissions we won't have, what accountability and justice we'll miss, what wrongdoing will go unchecked because of prosecutions like this, of Richard Boyle, of Bernard Caleri, of Mrs. K. That's why this case is so important. Prosecuting whistleblowers sends a chilling message to two colours all around this country. We never know where the next scandal will come from. We don't know who the next whistleblower will be, but we sure as hell know that less Australians will speak up because of cases like this. When they see Ed McBride going to court, when they see Richard Boyle going to court, and hopefully not, but the very real risk that today they'll see Ed McBride go to jail. The government has failed to act on this case. The Attorney General has the power to drop prosecutions. He failed to act. But there's three simple things the government can do from here. They can drop the prosecution of Richard Boyle. If David McBride goes to jail today, they can issue a pardon to get him out of jail. They can fix the law and they can create a whistleblower protection authority so that we have the change that we need to see. I'm an optimistic person by nature. It's hard to be optimistic on a day like today, but I hope that, it's often said it, it's darkest before the dawn. I hope that today and the outcry that will flow from the outcome today will lead to genuine reform. The Albanese government is entering its final 12 months in office. They promise reform to the PIT Act. We haven't yet seen that substantive reform. In 2019, they promised a whistleblower protection authority. We still don't have a whistleblower protection authority. We know what needs to be done. It just needs to be done. And locking up whistleblowers is not the right way. Thank you. Sorry to catch you out there, Jeff. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we also uh, are fortunate to have with us today somebody who has been doing a lot for whistleblowers recently. In fact, I think there's probably a couple of trucks around here that uh, have something to do with him. And that is uh, former Senator Rex Patrick, um, who will also say a few words. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Look, I've just been sitting here listening to the various different speakers. <laughs> the impression I'm left with is that the fabric of our country is, is, is torn, it's ripped. All sorts of stories that tell us that uh, we're not doing the sorts of things that most Australians would expect in terms of the way in which we govern, the way in which we uh, uh, deal with uh, you know, justice issues and so forth. So it's very, very sad, the stories that we've heard today. Unfortunately, we've got a situation where David McBride will walk into court today and he may be the first person jailed in relation to the war crimes in Afghanistan. But he's the whistleblower. He's the whistleblower. You really do have to ask the question, how did we get here? Is this your Australia? No. It's, it's not mine. And yeah, that's a really sad thing. The only thing we can hope for today is that uh, you know, there's, no, there's no real opportunity here for David to walk away without the conviction, without the harm that's already been done to him in terms of his family. But we can hope for a non-custodial sentence. Yeah. The reality is he has not harmed anyone. He has not gained anything at all. He never intended to, get, but to see any gain in respect of what has happened here. And he is not a risk to the Australian public. He's a hero and I hope today uh, he walks out the front door and that will be at least a sprinkling of justice. Uh, we can only hope. Thank you. Thanks, Rex. Well, I, I think the consistent theme from everybody shows that today is a massive failure on the part of the Albanese government. They had a clear choice. They had a brave man saying that the army hierarchy is corrupt. 
um, not only facilitated and covered up war crimes, but then start to make scapegoats out of innocent soldiers to cover up the cover up. Now, that has never been properly investigated, and the evidence that David needed to prove that in court to vindicate his actions was removed after the court case started under spurious national security cover. So I think I think another thing that comes out of this is that if you're going to prosecute people under national security, there should be some mechanism that actually gives them a fair trial. Yeah, yeah. Which I, I ask them to present evidence in camera in a civil court if necessary. And David didn't even get that. I mean, this is an, a, just a show trial. He never, he never even had a chance to mount his defence. And you've got to think the root is because the Albanese government didn't want to hear what he had to say.